Hello. Um, over the last few weeks, we have made, um... References. Uh, references uh, uh, to the royal family, uh, which, which could be construed as being slightly less than respectful. But this was, this was never intended. Never. <laughs> we understand that a certain person herself... Well, hardly <laughs> that. Well, a certain being, perhaps, a certain personage herself <laughs> has actually decided to watch this week's program. <laughs> um, to sort of... Uh, check up on the content. <laughs> so, so welcome to the program, Mom. <laughs> we are um, chuffed. <laughs> we, we, are, we are we are overawed and 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 to give you our humble offering. I hope you are amused by what you see. I I certainly, for one, feel extremely proud that I will be able to tell my grandchildren that a, a program I was in was actually watched by by Mrs. Whitehouse. <laughs> At a party to celebrate her 55th birthday last week, Mrs. Thatcher blew on the cake and lit the candles. The USA, and we must apologize for an error in one of our earlier bulletins, in which we said that Ronald Reagan had been hitting the coloreds and putting the balls on the table. We were, of course, referring to Ray Reardon. <laughs> News for horse lovers, and there was excitement for Lady Diana Spencer today when her hat blew off during a ride with Prince Charles. On hearing the news, the Duke of Edinburgh said, That's my boy. Come in, shut the door. Now then, Savage. I want to talk to you about some charges that you've been bringing lately. I think that perhaps you're being a little... Overzealous. <laughs> Which charge did you mean, then, sir? Well, for instance, this one. Loitering with intent to use a pedestrian crossing. <laughs> Savage, maybe you're not aware of this, but it is not illegal to use a pedestrian crossing. Neither is smelling of foreign food. <laughs> An offence. You sure, sir? <laughs> also, there is no law against urinating in a public convenience. <laughs> Or coughing without due care and attention. If you say so, sir. Yes, I do say so, Savage. Didn't they teach you anything at training school? Oh, sorry, sir. Some of these cases are just plain stupid. Looking at me in a funny way. <laughs> Is this some kind of joke, Savage? No, sir. And we have some more here. Walking on the cracks in the paper. <laughs> Walking in a loud shirt in a built-up area <laughs> during the hours of darkness. And walking around with an offensive wife. <laughs> in short, Savage, in the space of one month, you have brought 117 ridiculous, trumped-up and ludicrous charges. Yes, sir. Against the same man, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. A Mr. Winston Kodogo <laughs> of 55 Mercer Road. Yes, sir. Sit down, Savage. Yes, sir. Savage, why do you keep arresting this man? He's a villain, sir. A villain. And, and a jailbird, sir. I know he's a jailbird, Savage. He's down in the cells now. We're holding him on a charge of possession of curly black hair and thick lips. Uh, well, 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 there you are, sir. You arrested him, Savage. Thank you, sir. Savage, would I be correct in assuming that Mr. Kadogo is a coloured gentleman? Well, I can't say I've ever noticed, sir. <laughs> Stand up, Savage. Savage, you're a bigot. It's officers like you that give the police a bad name. The press love to jump on incidents like this, and the reputation of the force can be permanently tarnished. Your whole time on duty is dominated by racial hatred and petty personal vendettas. 
Did you get some kind of perverted gratification from going around stirring up trouble? Yes, sir. <laughs> There's no room for men like you in my force, Savage. I'm transferring you to the SPG. Thank you, right, sir. Right, now, get out. Yes, sir. Oh, it's my... Right, sir, it's, uh... It's your edge, sir. <laughs> Some people called him mad, but any friend of Hitler's can't have been all bad. <laughs> Bernard Oswald and Old Mosley. <laughs> Bernard Oswald and Old Mosley. He was popular and handsome as Richard Burton. <laughs> Cause I seen him on the box once with his black shirt on <laughs> And no, oh, I cannot claim to be any great authority As far as I'm concerned the sun shone out of his oratory <laughs> We've got an a great dictator Given half a chance But they treated him like a traitor So he went to live in France Baronet Oswald and all Mosley Challenge, and this week we welcome back the team from Parker's Prison, Isle of Wight. Jack the Raisin McLeod, Mad Axman Malloy, uh, and Roy Acidbath Peters, uh, all reading sociology with the Open University. And their team captain, Lenny of the Trousers Stevenson, doing a postgraduate course in writing pompous letters to the Times. Good evening. And their challenger from Wordwood Scrubs, Dr. James Stocks. Professor Reggie Stocks, Hello. Dr. Runny Stocks, Hello. and Booker Prize winner Wally Cook. Hello. <laughs> they were formerly the notorious Lambeth Garage Poisoners and are now all reading chemistry at the University of Warwick. <laughs> and the subject of the first round is London, your starter for ten. No conferring. Who was responsible for the shooting of Alec the Horse Bomparini on or about the 6th of July 1978? Parkhurst Stevenson. Uh, wide Boy Dixon. Wide Boy Dixon, a very plausible answer, Parkhurst. I can, I can let you have a full ten years remission there. Now, three questions. Three questions, five years each, you may confer. He, he, was, thought, he was thought to have been involved in the Blackheath security van heist. Uh, that's the dog. Uh, Reggie the dog, Trubshaw. Reggie the dog. Very well grasped indeed there, Parkhurst. And the second question, where is he hiding now? I'll have to hurry you. Uh, we're not sure. We'll have a guess. Uh, 31 Avenue des Anglais, Nice. Yes, I, I can believe that. And <laughs> finally, were the Lambeth Poisoners, the Lambeth Poisoners, also responsible for a string of bank raids in July 1979? Uh, no. I can give you some help here. Nice hotel in Rio, change of identity protection, 60,000 a secret bank account. Yeah, yeah, they did it, yeah, yeah. I like Chucky, I like Chucky, I like Chucky, and I like to truck. I like Chucky, I like Chucky, if you don't like Chucky, Chuck, Chuck. On the road, you must be brave and tireless. On the road, you can listen to the Chatting up that piece of skirt who's sitting by your side Then pop the crucial question A ride for a ride I like trucking, I like trucking I like trucking and I like to truck I like trucking, I like trucking If you don't like trucking, tough luck Perhaps the greatest laugh of all that makes this life worthwhile Is waving off the car behind him a smile with glasses and with gratitude he revs his little load and meets another trucking trucker trucking down the road 
like that on a public highway, you deserve to be called a raving maniac. 25 right, years I was in the police force, and quite honestly, I've second. never seen That's anybody um, drive in quite... Just a second, um, Sir Robert, that was fine, that was fine. Yes. Um, there's just one small thing. Um, if you could emphasise the road safety aspect of it slightly more than you were there in your own words, um, if you could emphasise the fact that tyres are more about safety than about danger, um, if you remember uh, your script, um, yes. I am convinced, I'm convinced that this is a major contribution to road safety. Uh, you are con let's try it just on your spot there. Okay, let's rehearse it and yes. rehearsal. Uh, I, I am convinced that this is... That's right. I'm convinced this is a major contribution to... To road safety. To, to road safety. I am convinced. You are I am convinced this is a major contribution. I am convinced that this is amazing. This isn't Starsky and Hutch, you know. Please it's alright. It's alright. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah? Uh, I wonder if you could help me, please. Um, I want to buy a gramophone. A what? A gramophone. <laughs> gramophone. <laughs> a gramophone. <laughs> I don't think we've got any gramophones here, Grandad. <laughs> What's that? That's a three-hour automatic cut direct drive turntable, unless I'm very much mistaken. And what's the difference between that and a gramophone? Well, about 30 years in a plastic cupboard, you chief. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like one of these, please. You sure? Yes, please. All right. This, this is going to be good. Right, well, as you can see, it's uh, it's got all the speeds. It's got 33 and 45. Yes, what, what do it... I do with my old 78s? <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? Nothing, nothing. Now you said what about my old 78s, didn't you? <laughs> no, no, I didn't, honestly, no. <laughs> all right. So, you got your deck. Right. Do you want a Dolby with it? Uh, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> you only had Dolby's with tape recorders, Chief, all right? <laughs> do you want an amp? Uh, no, I want that. <laughs> You won't hear anything, Grandad, without an amp, I'm afraid. Oh, so, of course, I, yes, I want an amp. You want yes, an amp. Yes, All right, what sort of output are you looking for? What sort have you got? Ah, <laughs> no, no clues. <laughs> About medium? How many watts exactly? Well, oh, I should think about, um, about three. <laughs> no, two, two thousand. <laughs> Five hundred? Thirty? Thirty? Thirty! Thirty! So you know all about it now, do you? You want a thirty-watt amp? A thirty-watt amp. Do you want speakers? Yes. Do you want rumble filters? Yes. Do you want a bag on your head? Yes. <laughs> there you are, a bag on your head. So you got your deck, you got your amp, you got your rumble filters, and of course, you got your bag on your head. Now, do you want woofers and tweeters? No, I don't want stupid <laughs> things like woofers. Well, you've got them when you want them or not, Grandad, they're in your speakers. <laughs> You'll be telling us you don't want slimline salad dressing. Yes, I do want slimline salad dressing. <laughs> <laughs> Your mind, it's your body, they're into my business, man. 
Hate the sight of the moth-eaten Snoopy doll she's had since college. And despise her brother, the chartered surveyor, who invites himself for dinner and drinks thy scotch after you've gone to bed. <laughs> Dost thou dislike her mother, hate her cooking, get irritated that she picks at her toenails in bed, and that the clippings somehow find their way into that little crack in the side of the duvet? And wilt thou forsake her for as long as ye both shall live? I will. Muriel, wilt thou leave this drunken shit who is thy brother? <laughs> Didst thou dislike the brevity and infrequency of his lovemaking? And wert thou so sick of having to lie to him about how it's not size that's important? <laughs> and, that, and that you'd have more fun in bed with one of those seaside collecting boxes made out of a mine? <laughs> and will you, if given half a chance, cheerfully wring his neck? I will. Who taketh this woman away from this man? I do. Just say these words after me. I take thee from thy wedded husband. I take thee from thy wedded husband. To have and to hold from this day forth. To have and to hold from this day forth. For I am Frank Hodgkiss. For I am Frank Hodgkiss. The lounge lizard from account. The lounge lizard from accounts. And thereto I plight thee my troth. And thereto I plight thee my troth. Dearly beloved, divorce is an honourable estate and is not to be taken in hand lightly, inadvisedly or wantonly to satisfy men's carnal lusts. Although that's a pretty good reason. <laughs> that just proves how blind and stupid uh, uh, Dennis and his party are. Uh, you know, I wonder if you know anything about economics at all. Uh, well, Mr. Robbins, your view. Well, now that Michael has allowed me to get a word in, I ha! have to say I've never heard such rubbish. And to think that this man is in the government is quite frightening. I resent that snide remark. It's exactly the kind of thing I have come to expect from your kind of politician. My kind of politician. If only the public knew to what depth some people will stoop when they enter this, the house. This is the kind of... This is the kind of politician who will... <laughs> will be greatly missed. <laughs> a, great, a great parliamentarian of our time and a close personal friend. <laughs> I am heartful. Dr. David Bellamy, preparing for his new TV series about alcoholic beverages, was rushed to hospital last night after drinking 27 pints of his favourite lager. His condition is reported as being fair to piddling. Security men responsible for the safety of President-elect Ronald Reagan have come up with a new device to prevent him from being shot through the brain. Bulletproof underpants. <laughs> there you are. There you are. There you are. That is just the kind of bad language and, above all, endless references to parts of the body that are becoming, by their ceaseless repetition, knob in the media. Just part and parcel and, and pubes of everyday conversation. <laughs> and that is why I insist that we must relief massage the bad language out of television. So, so what you're saying is that without our knowing it, our Tickle My Nuts language is becoming... <laughs> Inner thigh, yes. <laughs> Dr. Vison, if I may turn over, I like it better that way to you. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sorry, I just can't see what proof the Reverend Bartholomew has for this strange breast fondling theory. Well, you just, well, you just have to listen. You just have to listen, Dr. Stifled Moan Vison. Did you realize that in the middle of that sentence, for instance, you said breast fondling large nipple? I did not! <laughs> yes, yank on it, you did. That's my whole big thing point. People are swearing and uttering obscenities. Take me, take me without even knowing it. Oh, 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 oh huge melons. <laughs> You are, I'm afraid, imagining this pantyhose, Reverend. Which is hardly surprising, coming as it does from a soft underbelly just above the private equipment minister of the church. I beg your pardon, Wang. Now, 
let's be balls pizzle frank about this. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, gentlemen. That's all the lipstick around the nipple we have time for. <laughs> A great, huge, wobbly, dangly oh, one. Oh, Christ. <laughs> Just a moment. Half the cleanest. Ah, clean. Oh. Yes, I rather think you can. There's one particular ornament in your shop I've taken rather a fancy to. Ah, yes, sir. Which one is that, then? As you probably noticed, I've spent the last 15 minutes perusing what you have on display here. I've yes. taken into consideration every single article of merchandise. I must say how impressed I am by the high standards of your wear. Oh, thank you very much, sir. I've taken into consideration the magnificent porcelain shire horse with the genuine leather harness and the copper look barrel cart. The leaping dolphin water vessel with the detachable dorsal fin for the storage of cocktail sticks. And this charming balsa wood windmill with the musical barometer encrusted with seashells and bearing the timeless legend Frey Bonnie Scotland. And I've dismissed them all in favour of one exceptional piece. Oh, yes, sir. Which completely overawed me the moment I set eyes on it. And I have this, <laughs> and this burning desire, an uncontrollable urge, to purchase it and to place it in my possession. Yes, sir. And, and which item is that, then, sir? It's the rampant mackerel ashtray. <laughs> diligently fashioned in blue onyx, sitting atop a glistening rock pool which contains one perfect matchbox. Uh, yes, sir. this is a piece, I think. Yes. How much is it? Uh, well, that's um, £19.95, sir. How can I ever, ever thank you enough? Oh, oh don't mention it. I'm sure. To think. At last, it is mine. God! God! I hate it! I hate it! I detest it, cheap, nasty, and it do a little nauseous, nauseous, awful. I don't I know that I want to puke on it. <laughs> there was one other piece. I took rather a piece. We have received a large number of complaints about a sequence you may remember from last week's programme where a hedgehog was seen to be crushed under the wheels of a lorry. The BBC would like to apologise to hedgehog lovers everywhere for any distress caused by this sequence, but would like to point out that the hedgehog used was in fact a stuffed hedgehog, and we feel that we probably exhibited less cray than whoever it is who goes around stuffing them. <laughs> if you know who these people are, then please write to us at this address. We want to know who stuffs hedgehogs. Not the nine o'clock news, BBC Television Centre, Wood Lane, London, West 12. One of us is ugly, one of us is cute. One of us you'd like to see in her birthday suit. Two of us write music to a warehouse song. Sorry in translation, that line comes This cliche, nothing can go wrong. The world is just a great big stage. Each man plays his part in this concrete jungle. My sleeve is on my heart. On the beaches, we go swimming in the nude. Oh, how I wish now and then that we could sing something rude. Breast and bottom, tongue and inner thigh. Even 
Thomas. Good evening. Tonight we tackle a difficult and controversial subject, soccer hooliganism. With me in the studio, I have Professor Duff of Cambridge University, author of Crowd Control Psychology, and Sally Barnes, community worker from the borough of Lambeth. Now, over the last few weeks, both of you have been looking into the problem of English soccer crowd violence. What conclusions have you drawn, Professor Duff? Well, my team and I have really concerned ourselves fundamentally with a uh, statistical analysis of soccer violence as a whole, in tandem with and related to a uh, psychochemical and, uh, broadly speaking, a behavioural analysis of over a thousand individual soccer hooligans. And we've come to the inevitable conclusion that the one course of action that the authorities must take is to cut off their ghoulies. <laughs> I'm sorry? <laughs> Cut their ghoulies off. <laughs> yes. Well, Sally, I'm sure you'll have something to say about that point of view. Look, Jonathan, I know these kids. Um, <laughs> I've worked in the areas we're talking about around Lambeth, Lewisham. Um, I know their problems. I know their frustrations, lack of community facilities. I know their parents. And, in my opinion, Professor Duff's suggestion that we should cut off their ghoulies is the only solution. Absolutely. I mean, cut the ghoulies off. Cut them off. Chop them off right away. What do you mean? <laughs> cut them cut off. off their cut ghoulies, yes. <laughs> Get them right off. Off with the ghoulies now. Light them through. Well, uh, there we <laughs> have it. <laughs> Whip off the ghoulies. Yeah. Expert opinion seems to be in favour of... Uh, Cutting off their ghoulies! The ponderous pounding of the piano Is like the pounding in my heart And even though the verse has just begun It's time for the chorus to start your thighs out of my mind but they came back again see if you remember this one I'm ready to try again though twice in the night's more than I usually can do when you're around magic from Harrow on the Weald went into their local electricity board
afford showroom to buy a new fridge freezer. They paid cash for it, and within four days it was installed and took pride of place in their kitchen. All went well for a couple of weeks. The milk was cold, the food stayed fresh, and even the light worked when you opened the door. <laughs> but then the trouble started. On February the 19th, the Robinson's seven-year-old son, George, got an attack of appendicitis and had to be rushed to hospital. They rang the electricity board, who responded, This has got nothing to do with us. <laughs> the Robinsons left it at that, but this incident was just the tip of the iceberg. Just two days after this, on the 17th, a freak typhoon ripped off a whole side of their house. 79 Latchmere Road. Well, naturally upset by this, Mr. and Mrs. Robinson had a quarrel, which ended in Mr. Robinson savagely pushing his wife through a plate glass window. On both occasions, they contacted the electricity board, <laughs> and on both occasions, they were told, I'm sorry, this really has got nothing to do with us. <laughs> It was then that things began to go seriously wrong. Mr. Robinson ran his car into a bus queue and was shot by a police marksman. <laughs> Mrs. Robinson was attacked by a killer whale. <laughs> Mr. Robinson's mother was hit by a meteorite. <laughs> Prince Philip exploded. And I was arrested on the street. <laughs> and charged with causing an obstruction. It was then that we contacted the electricity board. <laughs> the young man who answered the phone seemed rather confused. He said, I'm sorry, this really has got nothing to do with us. Cereal. I'm indebted to a gentleman from Swansea who wrote to tell me that his television entertainment is constantly ruined by the appearance of a camp old twat who <laughs> continuously reads his appalling drivel over the air. Well, all I've got to say to you is this has nothing to do with me. <laughs> Let us all say the Apostles' Creed, as contained in the new revised version of the new revised version of the Book of Common Prayer, or meditation, it's the same thing, really. I believe in God. I, I, I believe, believe in God, the Father Almighty, or at least it stands to reason there has to be some sort of greater power, you know, like electricity sort, sort of thing. thing. And in Jesus Christ, who was obviously a fantastic bloke, and it's been proved historically that he actually did exist around that time, actually, <laughs> who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary. No, don't laugh. It could happen. After all, they can do it in a test tube these days. I mean, that proves it, doesn't it? The third day he rose again from the dead, a sort of reincarnation, if you like, did you see that program on BBC Two? <laughs> I believe in the Holy Ghost, telepathy, flying saucers, black magic. There must be something in astrology, gay liberation, the Loch Ness Monster, the abominable snowman, the Surrey Panther, copper bracelets for rheumatism, levitation, water divining, poltergeists, and the life everlasting. That is, if, if the, the bloody Russians, Russians don't invade Poland. <laughs> Amen. I believe that life is happy and death is sad. I believe my mom was married to my dad. I believe that things that aren't good tend to be bad. I believe, yes I believe. I'm prepared to believe that Nixon wasn't a crook. I'm prepared to believe love stories a readable book. I believe that the dirty doesn't work really dirty. I believe that Lucille Ball's still under 30. Yes, I believe Gerald Ford is clever. That Bob Hope will live forever. And that Lever is pronounced never. And the 
best film ever made is Saturday Night Fever. I'm prepared to say Colonel Sanders can fly, and that pigs and even DC tens can fly. I'm prepared to believe that things go better with coke, and that the Ayatollah tells a darn good knock knock joke. I believe some folk can hear what Bugs Bunny is saying. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Now, welcome to the press conference. And the next president of the United States is here to make himself available to answer any questions which you may care to put to him. Now, within reason, of course. Mr. President. Okay, right, uh, fire away. Uh, 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 Mr. Wiley there. Uh, yeah, Mr. President, what do you intend as your first move now that the election is over? I think perhaps the president should be allowed to answer that in his own good time. There's no point jumping the gun, though, is there? Uh, <laughs> Miss Deepwell. Mr. President, do you think you can crack the energy problem? Well, I'm afraid the president is not willing to answer that question at the present time. <laughs> On the contrary, I am more than willing to answer the question. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, I got that wrong. The president is willing to answer that question. <laughs> Next question, please. Uh, Mr. Cambridge. Yes, sir. There have been rumors that... Uh, uh, there's no reason for the president to stoop to answering that kind of cheap abuse now, is there? I'm sorry, uh, what rumors look, sh look, shut up, please. We can't hear the president speak. <laughs> Next question, please. Miss Deepwell, uh, you've got another one there. Uh, this one's for the president. <laughs> aren't we all? Aren't we all? Very well, sir. How do you feel about your victory? Oh, well, no. it's no big deal, is it, really? Uh, <laughs> one guy wins, the other schmuck loses. Who, 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 who gives a damn, for Christ's sakes? Uh, next question. What about energy? He's got lots of it. Don't be so dumb insulting you. Gentlemen, please, <laughs> excuse me. I uh, feel look, like... Look, look, excuse me, sir. It will be altogether more orthodox if you only answer direct questions instead of butting in like some simple-minded horse whenever it pleases you. I'm trying to hold a press conference here. Well, I, I'm perfectly capable of answering any question that may be asked of me. Oh! Oh, oh, fair enough. Okay, the 40th president of the United States awaits your questions, ladies and gentlemen. Fire away! The president of the United States of America, Mr. Big here, is running, <laughs> waiting to answer your... Any, any question with incisive wit and drive that you may care to put to his massive presidential brain. <laughs> All yours, sir. Right, very well. Mr. Tucker, you asked me about my feelings on racial relations. Yes, sir. And the president replies, mind your own gut on business, Tucker. Marshal, <laughs> please. My feelings on race relations... Are entirely immaterial. Are <laughs> that for the past 200 years... The American people have conjoined with each other, with each other, uh, in a great quest for um, harmony. Uh, harmony, democracy, democracy, freedom, freedom, cupcakes, cupcakes, <laughs> crumbly candy bars, crumbly candy bars. That's incredible, isn't it? It's incredible, isn't it? That a cretin such as that a cretin <laughs> such as this should become president of the United should States. become president <laughs> of the United States. <laughs> Donald Reagan has emphatically denied that his luxuriant red hair is dyed and added that it was that color when he bought it. <laughs> Ronald Reagan has told reporters that the main turning point in his successful election campaign came when Jimmy Carter admitted to taking advice from his daughter Amy. When we heard that, said Reagan, my horse and I had a jolly good laugh. <laughs> And President Ronald Reagan set the record straight for journalists today, telling them that when he spoke of Nancy Reagan, he was, of course, referring to his wife, not his son. <laughs> Suter, when you first came to this school, we took you on account of a most entertaining essay you wrote about a parrot that belonged to your aunt. Ah, yes, sir. Hmm. 
Since then, your progress has been disappointing. I have here your exam papers from this year. Let's take a look at the general paper, shall we? Question one was, write an essay about perseverance. Yes, sir. Do you remember how you began this essay, Suter? Uh, no, sir. Read this, it'll help. Uh, general paper, final exam, T. Suter, autumn 1980. Subject, perseverance. Yes, get on with it. My aunt, who I live with, has a parrot called Perseverance. <laughs> One day. Yes, and you proceed to tell exactly the same story you told when you arrived at this school. Yes, sir. Here's a slightly different one. History, question five. What was notable about the late 50s? And your answer? My aunt, who I live with, used to have a parrot called 50s, who is now dead. The most notable thing about the late 50s was his enormous appetite. <laughs> And question seven. Uh, describe the South Sea bubble and its effect on investment. Go on. The South Sea bubble was a large goldfish <laughs> and its effects on investment, which was a parrot owned by my aunt, <laughs> who I live with. Super! Do you think I am some sort of cretin? Do you think I haven't noticed? It's with whom I live! <laughs> My aunt with whom I live! Not who I live with! <laughs> George, you see, oh. Julie and I have a very open marriage. And I honestly think that's the only way it can be if you, if you work in London. <laughs> no, no, I could never have that kind of relationship, could you? Sure, yeah. yeah we have a very open marriage. Very, very open relationship. Mm. What, do you have affairs with other women? Sure, yeah. I mean, I'm I not mean, saying I... Sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say that if he wants to sleep with other women, that's okay with me. And I, I'm sure it's the same the other way around. Oh, sure. I mean, if she wants to sleep with other women, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> but you do come back together again in the end. Look, look, George. If Sue wants to sleep... Sarah. Sorry? <laughs> I'm Sarah. Sarah. Sorry, sorry, love. Um, you two should do live together, don't you? Well, well, not exactly in the same place, no, but I mean... It's no hassle getting to Norwich. <laughs> you live in Norwich? No, no, Jonathan lives in Norwich. Chester. You live in Chester? You move? No, 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 I'm Chester, not Jonathan. <laughs> Excuse me, have you two ever met each other before? Look, I, it's a meeting, it seems it's just an old-fashioned kind of concept, really. I, I think if you love somebody, then knowing them isn't really that important, is it? <laughs> Love, please. Any particular one, sir? Well, um, because we've got a um, Pop, Skull, Fritzberg, Fritzling, Fritzling Late, um, Stella Tortoise, <laughs> Anarchic Freight, some Ostrogoth um, loose label there, <laughs> then there's um, Lemming, <laughs> then there's um, Cat's Pilf, <laughs> Goat's Hoof, Lowbrow, Le Bru, Lou Bru, and Stalag 49. Well, that's some... Or would you rather be hemorrhaging? <laughs> no, no, I don't think Or so. there's Heinrich Himmleken, mm -hmm. Skull Export, um, Crooning Bug, and then there's Everest, that's brewed by Germans in the Himalayas, that one. Yes, well, then perhaps I'll have some of that. Draft, sachet, can, bottle, or aerosol? Uh, <laughs> draft. Tall glass, thin glass, schooner, <laughs> vase, bowl, goblet, or pipette. Pint. I should have a pint. A pint of draft Everest. And a packet of... Crisps? Um, no, no, some pork scratchings. Pork scratchings or chicken itchings, <laughs> donkey scabs, hedgehog stuffings. <laughs> it's time, gentlemen, please. Could I have all your glasses? No, please, sorry, sir, we're closed. Could I have all your glasses? No, please, thank you. A cornflake manufacturer has defended his product against charges of poor nutritional value. Cornflakes are full of goodness, he says, particularly when sprinkled on food. <laughs>
Tighter controls are to be introduced to safeguard Britain's potential transplant donors. In future, donors must at least be feeling unwell before an organ is removed. <laughs> Sir John Gilgood has been defending his appearance in the film Caligula and claims there was no mention whatever of sex and brutality when he read the original paycheck. <laughs> Well, I'll be buggered if I go out there tonight. <laughs>